Okay, so thank you, thank you all for, for coming, and my thanks to the organizers for inviting me to give a speak, uh, to give a talk, and to participate in the program. And special thanks to Angela who's who's here. Um, so I want to talk about electro reception, which is a recently discovered uh, sensory perception in, in some arthropods. But before I get to that, just a quick introduction. So everything I'm going to be talking about today is joint work by Daniel Gober, who's a biologist at Bristol, where I am, and Ryan, who, who's a mathematician, who did a postdoc with Robert and myself, but now is a lecturer in the School of Engineering and Mathematics, also a teacher. And the work was funded by the BBS at the ground to Daniel and myself. Now, most of what I've been talking about has been published or will appear very soon. So if you can, if you would like to learn more or ask me more questions, uh, please feel free to, and I can share pre uh, preprints and papers with you later. Now, I'm going to do something a little bit cheap. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to myself uh, because I'm going to be, be here for two and a half weeks and I would love to talk to more people and collaborate. So this is a purely self-centered <laughs> pitch for myself before I go into the actual science of today. So my core expertise is actually not in biology and electroreception, which I'm going to talk about, is something I've been doing only for a few years. My training actually was in solid and structural mechanics and topics I worked on are multi-phase solids, uh, typically microstructures that come, for example, from uh, say, uh, shape of material or something similar, uh, and uh, semi-convex envelopes like quasi-convex envelopes, hyper-convex solids, etc. organization. So that's been my classical training, or I should say my doctoral training, and my post work as well. Uh, much more recently, I've become interested in morphing structures and architecture materials, and I work a lot of engineers in there. And I've also, over the last uh, seven years or so, developed interest in mathematical biology. And I worked on wound healing, education planning, and group for interaction, and echo reception, which is, which is um, what we talk about today. I'm very pleased to be able to talk to people about new topics. So if you'd like to uh, say some, talk to me about science in the next turn of weeks, please feel free to catch me. OK, so with that pitch, uh, jump into the science. So what is electroreception? That's what I want to introduce this sensory perception to you. So it's the ability that some arthropods, which are, let's call them insects to be, to be familiar, have to detect and respond to electrical things. Okay, so here, for example, let me walk you through some of the examples. So here uh, are some kinds of spiders. And if you look carefully at the spider, you will see a thread coming out of it. So that is an electrically charged thread. And what the spiders do, actually very interesting. So they, they, they sit on typically a, a sharp surface, for example, the edge of a flower, as you can see here. And they stand upside down, so head downwards and bottom up. And they shoot out a, a spider silk thread that's, that's charged. So this is the multiple thread, which is it's charged. So yeah, these are the legs of the spider. No, no, this is not a leg. This is a, a, a silk thread that has, has shot out. Just okay. Now, what this does is that it interacts with the Earth's atmospheric and electric so often we have lungs of function which are constantly charged and the lungs of the surface charge the surface so there's an electric gradient so we roughly about 120 volts of that depends on the weather conditions and local to it's relatively flat on a calm day it's about 120 volts per meter so this charged object in the selective field, as of course, experiences a force which counteracts gravity. So, when you have yeah, sufficiently long thread, it's enough to lift. So, the spider flies off into the air. Okay, or flying not in an airplane, but because the balance of gravity and air. Okay, so the charge of the spider. 
and, and they can fly upwards for several hundred meters. And once they're sufficiently up in the air, they can be float around with the, with the, the airstream. And spiders have been found tens, and I think if I'm not mistaken, even hundreds of kilometers, I'm not sure about it, certainly tens of kilometers out into the ocean. Um, where, where you can see spiders falling on ships from the air because they've taken off from the land and come down the sea. So this is a very, very, very known phenomenon. In fact, Charles Darwin observed it on one of his voyages. And you can see a very old example of not quite sensing electric fields, but using electric fields to, to transport yourself. Now, this is not fully understood by the way. If anybody is looking for an interesting biological problem to model and study, with, with, uh, it is not with the full details of what spiders do are not something fully understood. Okay, now what I'm going to be talking about today is not quite that kind. So if you look at bumblebees, and you can see a bumblebee that's uh, trying to uh, be close to a flower. And what we know is that these bumblebees can interact with the charges of flowers. This is schematic for this one over here. So here's a, a flower. And we know that the surface of a flower is electrically charged. And if you're interested, I can show you the experimental evidence later on. And we also know that these are charged, charged. We think it's because of triboelectric charging, let's say, right in the atmosphere. And they charge it's about 100, a few hundred picocoulombs. So when they're sufficiently close to a flower, it's about, let's say, about 10 centimeters or, or that kind of a distance, they, 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 they're close enough to sense electric charges from a flower and, of course, vice versa. So, and they could use this for pollination because we have good reasons to think that how much pollen a flower has is reflected in what its charge distribution is in surface. And therefore, a bee, in principle, we don't know for sure, but in principle, would be able to, to tell whether a, a flower is worth visiting or not from the fourth three landscape from this one. So, not very great large and simple, but it's good evidence. Now, there is good experimental evidence for the second half of what I said. So we have experiments where these were given two identically, uh, two identical uh, dishes, one with a bitter solution, one with a sweet salt solution, which they like. So the same in every way, except that the sweet solution had electric, electric field close to it. And you can see that these can tell the difference between the two. And they did this because they can use sensor um, Okay, so that's the 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 uh, empirical evidence for this. Now, how do they do this? Now, if you look at the bee, I'll show you a close-up image in a, in a few slides. It has small hairs all over its surface, typically from one tenth of a millimeter to about one, one millimeter. And we know that these hairs, like the hairs of the, of the spider silk over here, and the silk over here, is a charged object because we can deflect it by using electric electric charges. So uh, we think that these gel, these hairs are charged and they deflect in the electric field caused by flower, which is how the bee detects it. Okay, I'll, I'll expand on this in a, in a few slides. By the way, please feel free to stop me as often as you want with questions. And my, my talk is quite modular, so I will stop whenever I run out of time. Okay, a little bit more uh, empirical evidence. We know that there are some species of caterpillars that react intensively to a electric field, which feels electrically like that of a box. So this is the you know, wing beat frequency, and the, the charge we expect of the with a simulation, uh, not done by me, but by, by the former student of Daniel Robert. So that's the caterpillar, that's the boss. If you have charges on the wings and the wing beats, you get an oscillating electric field, uh, so the frequency, and there are species of caterpillars that can detect this frequency of charge oscillation and associate that with the, with the, with the predator detector detection system. And finally, with, with digression, we also know that there are butterflies and moths that can, can have touch free pollination, so to speak. So we call it pure pure attraction. Okay, now in this talk, I'm going to focus, I'm going to talk about bees. But everything I say is going to be in general apply to other species in general. So, for example, here is a, a tree hopper. So, this is a creature that lives in Central America, in Costa Rica, for example. 
it's about the size of my thumbnail. So this is about this is about one centimeter. And you can see it's two eyes. It, it's really about lives on leaves, really. And up here it has these uh, these strange uh, protrusions that are roughly spherical in shape with lots of hairs that you can see. And we think that these are also electrically charged and are the primary purpose is to detect electrics. That's what we do. Yes, by the way, I should sort of note. You, you also have electroception and aquatic features, which is much better known, uh, but I won't be talking about that stuff. So I'm going to purely focus on the reception. Yeah. I don't know anything about it, but is electroception still a hypothesis, or is it widely accepted that this is not very? Uh, it's well, it depends on exactly which precisely which statement you're talking about. It's widely accepted. For example, let me go back a few slides. Mm -hmm. So, th that these threads are charged is widely accepted because it, we, have, it, we can actually do the experiment very easily yourself. Uh, the bumblebees are charged is, is definitely established because you can make them fly through a, a coil and detect the what happens. So, that is known. Charge, the flowers are charged is well known because then you can. Sprinkle electro sensitive dust on them and they rearrange themselves to, to for the other field. So that part is known. Now, are, are these specific pairs electrically charged? We have good evidence in the sense that you take a single hair and you put electric field a charge close to it, you can see it deflect. Now, whether that, that mimics nature is, is, is one step from a single hair to a, a real living being. On the other hand, I think it's fairly well established because we know that bees are charged. We know that electric charges try to, try to migrate to high regions of high curvature. So if they're somewhere on the bee, it's very likely there are sharp, sharp parts of the bee, which is a fair test. So it's, it's, it's one step removed, I swear, but it's, it's close. Uh, similarly, this is an empirical test. So we do know that there are species that can sense Yes. Now, how they do it is, of course, one, one step beyond this. Unit. So, a lot of it is empirically known, but not every single bit I'm going to talk about. It. Okay, so a number of questions. And by the way, uh, this, this is coming from a very uh, applied mathematics background. So, I'm not going to be so concerned about the fine details of nature. We really can ask a few conceptual questions, right? How are electric fields detected? And if you had an ultraport that can detect electric fields, what would it do with it? Like, what can you do if you have this new sensory perception that is very unfamiliar to us students? Okay, so let's talk about how electric fields can be detected. So here is a close up of a bumblebee. I can see it's compound eyes. So we have the compound eyes. It has these uh, antennae that come out close to the eyes and it's surrounded by. by and our hypothesis is that at least some, if not all of these hairs are electrically charged, not just near the head, but around this, around this world. So a working hypothesis is going to be that these and similar features have a number of hairs, which we're going to model as follows. We're going to model them as inextensible rigid rods with a charge at the tip over here, the half tone. Which are connected at the base to a spring dashboard system. So, in other words, I have an inverted medium of energy with some inertia uh, damping and stiffness. And this pendulum can oscillate because, because of well, it can oscillate because of fluid flow. So it, it, it can act as a mechanical system. But in addition, because they have a charge of the tip, can also oscillate because of fluid interactions. And the nervous central nervous system of the of the creature can detect the oscillation because of this system over here. So here's the actual uh, uh, photograph. So this is five five microns, this is five microns. So what you're seeing here is the base, the base of the you see this over here. So this is the head of the head. That's the this is the socket. And in, in this case, we think it oscillates in one direction, or at least primarily in one direction, this this direction. Where it's, it's, this is the oval shaped socket, so it prefers one direction. And underneath it, we have a sensory system that can detect the oscillation. So that's our primary sen sensory mechanism. This is the sensor that, that we're going to postulate. 
Now, if you accept that as a primary modeling hypothesis, then let's see what we can do with that. So, a lot of details here, please don't worry about that. Let's focus on figure for the moment. I'm going to start by considering a B that has just three heads. Okay, it's a three head B. And here, here yes, it's, it's a, <laughs> later on, I'm going to go to a one head B. Okay, so this is this is actually quite complex. <laughs> okay, but the three is not important yet. You can, once you see what I'm doing, you can see the three are important. Okay, so it's a three, three head B. Think of it like a, uh, the B equal to a spherical curve. Okay, now we have. Uh, I think it's fun to see. Uh, point charges are at the tip of each of these heads. These are ranges pendulum. So what you can measure is the, the angle of the A. Okay, that, that's our that's our, our three variables. And okay, now let's what what I'm looking over here. So I I have the for any given head, so H the first any of these heads, I have the the tip position. I that's at the base position at the base, and then that's that's the angle. Okay, and that head length like this this one. So, so that's so two parameters so far this this position and length. and then I have my my oops I can't see here this one no I can't how is there this no I think you can do it thanks the other this one that's that, that's good enough that's fine yeah so what I've done over here is just taken a basic equation. So top is equal to this over here, and so over here. So that's that's all the dynamical terms on the side are uh, uh, normalized. And over here, I'm showing the top. So the, the details are only not important. The two things to notice here are QP is this external point charge. It's just one point charge here. And that gives me uh, a torque on each of these pairs. That's the term over here. So that's just the torque acting because of this charge. And then capital N is three in this case, and three has, and this gives me the, the force on each and because of the other three has. So it's just the internal interaction. Okay, so there's an internal interaction term because of the three has interaction among themselves, an external term because of the external function. Yeah, and then I've renormalized the equation, uh, put in some wrong number. Yes. Um. To clarify the point charge subtracting one. Or either way, it doesn't matter. Okay. So we are agnostic about the, the, the sign of this charge. It could be, could, so we assume that these three others are all the same. So they're oh. These three by themselves, the yeah. yeah. But this one could attract one. Okay, so that's that's that that's our puppy. Okay, so now the question is, what can this what can this be do? Okay, good. Okay, so the first thing you notice is that so here and subsequently I'm normalizing all my lengths to be multiples of L. Okay, that's going to be my primary length scale. So all these numbers are multiples of length scale. And what you see over here is that it's actually fairly straightforward that you understand. There's a blind spot on top of the right because if I'm since I'm, I rely on talks to like my hair, so I'm vertically on top of the hair, I, I feel no problem. So I'm vertically, this B is, is rather blind in this direction. You know, you can only see clearly from towards the side. And what these contour lines indicate. Is how clearly you can see the further away a charge, the less it affects the set, and the less the value of the charge of the magnitude, the less it affects the set. So this is rough. This these contours are contours of constant inflection of that. Okay. So charge moving on this contour over here would not if, a, if, a, this, if this charge object charge point move along this line, it would deflect it by, by, by constant. Right? It's all to be constant along uh, and here's here's a same figure most likely drawn. So what we see here is that there is an envelope beyond which a unit charge will, will deflect the hair to 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 for it to for it to um, be detected. So you have to be this this, this so the theta s is our, our minimum angle that we can measure. 
then this is the, the threshold that you need to cross before you can, you can measure the angle for a given unit charge. Of course, these thresholds depend on the charge magnitude as well. So they the have your cross. So now we could, and this is the reason why we pick three hairs, because with, if you have three hairs in two dimensions, then you can locate the position of a point charge and also figure out how much it's charged. So if I, uh, is there any need for me to go into detail here? Yeah, no detail if it's not clear. Because essentially, there are three unknowns. You have the x and y coordinates of unknown charge and its value. So you have three unknowns to figure out. And you need three measurements to figure those out, and three measurements will be the three values of your head collections. And then you can you can locate the single point charge. Now, of course, the B doesn't need to have three hairs. If you only have, only have one pair, you just have to move it and take measurements from three different locations in space, and then you get the same. And of course, if you have more than three hairs, you can locate multiple charges and you use a table. Right? So uh, a B with 300 hairs can detect. Other charges, other point charges, or, or if you move around to other locations, you can have some things. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm saying you have a time dependence. I'm sorry, you have time yes. dependence. Yeah. In the yeah. What's the source of the time dependence? Is the charge moving in your model, or is the or are you interested in the oscillation? Of yeah. So at the moment, in, in what I've said so far, there's no charge somehow. So this is a static charge. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now we do look at charge motion. I said, in fact, that's going to be my next slide. Yeah. Sorry. So, no, that's, that, no, that's fine. The questions are most welcome. And even anticipated questions are even more welcome. So typically, we think that the wing tips are also charged. So when a bumblebee uh, flies, it's, it's, it's actually setting on oscillating, spatially oscillating charge. And so we, we try to see whether we can extend the analysis to spatially oscillating point process. And actually, everything goes through the I won't go into details here, but essentially, so here's my B number one, that's its body, that's its hair. And here is some other B number two, or of course, that's a point charge which is oscillating. And this is similar to dynamical. So we can, we can pick up not only the Position of this charge and also pick up its oscillation frequency and things like that. And in fact, it turns out that it makes it easier to detect. So here is a simple example. So zeta here is the damping parameter. Um, and what I've drawn here is actually let me focus on one of these dots. It looks similar. So what you see here in this in this this white line is the Measurement threshold for static charge. Okay. And uh, dash and tick line simply means on the left hand side. So there's no deal between this and this. It's two different sides. And what you see is that if you have an oscillating charge, uh, radial here means it's oscillating like this. Uh, sorry, magnitude means it's oscillating like this, radial means it's oscillating like this. Okay. What you see is that your, your measurement threshold is getting pushed up. It's easier for you to see if it's oscillating than in one that's different. So, in fact, if, if you are if you are prey and you watch on the predators, the fact that the predator is dropping its wings makes it easier for you to see. And this ties in with the wasp example I gave you, the caterpillar example I gave you in the beginning. So, the caterpillar is helped to live longer by the fact that the wasp is eating its wings. And of course, the frequency different different uh, insects beat their wings at different frequencies. So you can actually try to guess what is approaching you by touching the in bit frequency. Okay, so the, the, it's a lot of work done over here, but I, I'll just skip this because I just want to give you the broad overview for today. Okay, so we so far we've seen that uh, that uh, that uh, a bee can pinpoint. The location of point charge and figure out what is going to do this. And by the way, we've now left behind the world of empirical evidence. Okay, so this is, I don't have direct empirical evidence for this. This is uh, a conceptual understanding of what a bee could do given that it can detect that with this. So now let me work you with a fun example. Uh, it turns out that you can actually navigate using electric force. Okay, so here's, here's what we did we took a, a, a baby bee from street. In other words, a bee that does not know values of its own head parameters. So here is my 
my fresh newly born B that has three hairs, but it doesn't know it's the, the distribution of the hair. It doesn't know how, how long the hairs are, what the sequence is, how much of it is. Okay, so it's, it's has to be trained. And what we did is we told the, the we assumed that the B somehow perhaps from its parents, again, I'm not I'm using very biologically inaccurate terms because I don't know what B is, so from B is what. Okay, so there are two charges here whose locations and values are known. Okay, and now the question is can the B elevate its type parameters from this given information? And it turns out it can, in fact, doesn't need to do very much. So you can see here, this is my three head B, and it has, it has taken measurements of five different positions. Fairly close, right? So this is hair length. So it has moved by the distance of eight hair lengths, and the charge is trying to it. it knows about this about 10 hair lengths. So it's a really, really small expression system. And it turns out that this is enough information for the B to figure out all the values of its of its, of its parameters. So all the non types so let me take and just go back. There you go. All the non dimensional parameters that I need to solve my equations, I can learn from these two known point charges. You have the three in the way between the one? Yes, that's correct. And then you solve them in one or three of the parameters. Um, them in or So everything in this talk is in plane. It's a 2D algorithm. just for one straight or for three? It depends on the context. Let me come back here. So in this case, I'm doing it for three. So in this case, it's an inverse problem. Okay. I have three pendulum, but I don't know their, their parameters. But I do know that they're oscillating because of these two charges, this location, and I'm able to stop. What is the dynamical equation for the second derivative of the time when you introduce that third one in five? Yes. Yeah, yeah. The reduction of this. And in fact, that the um, the quite good empirical measurements of these. Things. So what we have, I, I have a slide by Edward also. So for for spiders, uh, I think it's, but I'm not sure about these. But the same spiders, I think it's, we have uh, good measurements of the the inertia, the damping, the damping. And the stiffness as functions of the length. It turns out these depend on length because the the thickness depends on the length as well. So, but the 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 smooth the smooth level of uh, characterization of these quantities for spider materials. For bees, I'm not sure. I mean, it, it, either, either it has been done or it can be done for spiders to be for some of these two. But of course, the, the B itself cannot do these experiments. So this is the, the idea of the training test. Can it figure out what it needs to know from all the job instructions? Now, once it has gone through this learning phase, you can then ask it to, oh, by the way, sorry, one more thing. So actually, not only can it do it, you can do it to suffice accuracy. So here I've given you some, some uh, simulation results. So these are four unknown parameters. The, the head spacing between the heads, the length of the head, uh, its stiffness and the charge value of the at stiff. And you can see here the, the typical uh, error it makes in trying to understand what the parameters are. And the, the maximum, so relative error, the maximum relative error is typically only about 10 power minus 2, for example, for, for the collision and similarly for the stiffness and the charge. And it's much, much better for the effect. So you can actually learn these parameters to very, very good accuracy. Okay, so now the B has learned about its parameters. You can now go out into the world and try to locate itself with respect to known point values. So it's exactly the same equations as before. So we, we have these are all the self-interaction terms, and these are the interaction with unknown unknown charges. But now it's a numerous problem. You know what the the forces. What we don't know is the position very well. So the, the position of the guy is down. But you can solve this. The system and locate yourself. So here is a, a, a simulation we did. So here is once again a, a three head B, and it has three three charges in space. So one, two, and three over here. And 
it knows where these three hydrogens are. And it's asked to fly a part related to this. So this is the part that's asked to fly. And you can also see the part that it actually fits. So it, it, it fumbles a bit at a few places, but then corrects itself and goes through the part. So it's able to navigate itself by locating the, by triangulating its position with respect to these three uh, parts. This is actually very similar to stellar navigation. So if you, if you replace electric fields by visual measurements and these three sources by three stars, it's doing exactly what it does used to do in the past. Look at the stars and try to locate their own position. Again, we don't know if we actually do this. In case of your, this is what it could do with the, with the equipment data. Okay, so I think this is my uh, two more. How am I doing for time? So, okay, good. So, here's our next uh, uh, question. Can we detect the flower? So, I've already pointed out that flower is actually electrically uh, charged objects. So, here is, uh, so we can we can measure electric fields of flower surfaces. And so, here is our uh, model for a flower. So, what you see over here, this is the, the 2D flower, of course, the rough shape of the uh, base. And they put point charges to the middle of the flower. And there's this concentration of charges here to make the, the central stem. Okay. So that's our, our electrical representation of a flower. And here's the electric field that you can use. So it looks, these point charges, which are not all the same value by the way, they're different magnitudes, are chosen to make electric field, electrical, inside the electric field look something like this. Okay. So what we're trying to do is not make the charges the same as what we see in a flower, but make it the same as what we see in a flower. So the certain electric field is, is realistic, at least in 2D. And what we want to know is, can a bee from a distance tell you that this is a flower because the electric field looks like this? So here is, um, here is our, uh, so that's a schematic flower. And what we did is we took our, our three head bee, I made it approach the flower using four different trajectories, which are seen four different So this, this is a straight approach, this is a fly path, this is a sinusoidal approach, and this is a, a fly path in the square. Okay, so three, four different paths that we can take is independent. And then we looked at the reconstruction of the flower as seen by the bee. So what, what the bee does is, so this is the bee had in its mind uh, a 20 by 20 grid. And it has at each grid point an unknown value of charge that it wants to assign. So it has four hundred unknown charges it wants to assign. And it does that by taking measurements of the electric field as it flies along the path and reverse calculates what are the four hundred charges I need to have here to give me the electric field that I have measured along my path. So that's, that's the calculation is doing. So it does this calculation. You can see what it thinks the object is electrically. So it applies like this and does this calculation, it thinks the object looks like this. So the light color is a low charge, black is no charge, zero charge, low charge, and high charge. And, and it applies like this, so head on, it thinks the object looks like this, and, and so on. And you can see that either this approach where it applies in a curved manner or the sinusoidal approach actually gives it a fairly uh, a good idea of what, what's looking It actually captures the shape of the flower pretty well. And we know from, from empirical observations that in these approach flowers, they typically don't approach the straight path. They actually prefer to do the same sort of path. This is much more likely to happen in nature than, than this, this sort of thing. Okay, so now this is uh, uh, this is going to be my, the last part I want to talk about. This is uh, work we're doing at the moment with a undergraduate summer student, Toby Long. In fact, he's not finished his work yet. So, what we're trying to do is go a little bit into B psychology, or maybe I should say neurology. So the idea is, at the moment, we are not looking into what happens inside a bee. How does it store, process, and manipulate knowledge of electric fields? But you want to do it conceptually. Okay? So you want to say, if you were designing a bee and you could give it some sensors, some 
memory. Uh, so we need to go around. How would you design a minimal B that can interact with the kids? Okay, that's, that's a top step. So it's a B design. So here's our minimal B. So we have a B that has the most basic electric sensor. Okay? We can detect electrical fields in one direction as it goes. So this is, this is the, the one pair B I promised I will tell you about. So this one pair B, it has, the think of this B as having just one this B. And one head, and all you can do is measure the deflection of this one. Head. In fact, you can't even get a common. But so, so this B is completely blind in this direction. So it's moving in this blind direction. It can't see anything straight ahead because it only sees rocks. So the only thing that actually can see is this direction. Okay. So you can one head and only see in one direction. Okay. That's a minimal sensor. And then this B has minimal location awareness. It's able to apply a specified angle, and this is realistic because we know bees can do that. So we know that when bees do the muggle dance to tell the hive where honey can pollen can be found, the way they do this is by specifying angles in respect to the soil. So that's the information contained in the dance. So we know that bees can remember and communicate angles with respect to the soil. So this bee can find a specified angle with respect to the soil. And you can measure and record distances along straight lines. And again, this is realistic because in a vagal dance, the bee tells its fellow bees how far they source of this. So that's my minimum location awareness. And then it has very minimal memory. You can store and compare three real numbers in, in real time. Yeah, that's it. It's, 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 it's CPU if you want, or it's RAM. There's a medium term memory. You can, you can locate the information above. And as long term memory, it can store pairs of real numbers. Okay, that's my intellectual, my cognitive, my memory equipment for that. And finally, you can do some minimum computation. You can add or subtract and multiply real numbers. Okay, now what I want to show you through a blackboard uh, 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 calculation is that with this minimal information, that we can actually map a basic map of the uh, electrical Okay, So here's how it is going to be. So, First, I let me set a few parameters. I'm going to pick some minimum charge, which is my threshold of what I want to see. So I don't I don't care about charges that are smaller than this cube. Okay. And now my sensor here has some minimal force element or minimal which is really going to talk about this one force. Below which you cannot measure deflections. Okay. So it's a minimal torque. You don't want computer to call it even torque. The minimum torque I can measure, measure and the minimal charge I can. Okay. This tells me some maximal distance beyond which I cannot detect this minimal charge. Okay. So the, the minimal charge exactly at this distance spoken against the B would deflect this single hair by with minimal time. Okay. Above that, I can't see this minimal charge. Okay. Inside, I can see uh, uh, I, can, I can see larger charges outside, but I want to see any charges at least few them. So this is my threshold box. Okay. So there's there's a strip of, of there's there's a strip of in which I, I can see an uh, with the alignment of the vision case. So here, here is a large field, and I'm the B, and I want to map map for this field does. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to apply the straight line at edge map distance away from the edge of the field. Okay. Now let's say there's a point charge somewhere. Else. As I fly in this direction, remember I can, I can only compare in my, in my short term memory, I can only compare three real numbers. Okay, I, I can't remember too much. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure the deflection of my hair. I'm going to, when I see a local maximum, I'm going to record. Okay, so, if there's a charge over here, for example, and let's say it's, it's an attractive charge, um, so then I will see a local maximum over here. And I record it. Then maybe 
Now, then I fly in this direction, let's so fly like this. And I do exactly this. So when I see the there's a charge here, so I can like reflects me, I notice this, I reflects this. So I have major y1 y Okay, so it has me let me stop with this for now. So now I measure two x coordinates and two y coordinates. So this tells me that there are four candidate locations for my point charts. So from the B's perspective, it doesn't know where the charges are. They could be located here or here or here or here. So now to sort it out, I buy it in a different direction. Is and that now will help me to throw away the two previous ones. Now, all I need to do this is to compute the let's say the one of one coordinate in the new coordinate system. So, I can just have to do the multiplication by cosine and sine to tell me what are the projections on the quantities of these charges on the new coordinates. So, that's this multiplication addition which I've already said my. My B can do. And then compared to the coordinates, it tells me that I should be able to figure out which of these are spurious and the other charges. So here is a, a, a computational demonstration of that. So here is my electronic B. It has, this, this is a square. It's exactly how much you can see. So it has flown in three directions. So there's a horizontal path like this, a vertical path in the center, and a diagonal path. And that these are these are the real charges that it has. And we first generated four possible locations for them. But flying you know, the vertically, then we're flying diagonally, it could go away to this two and locate the charges. Now it doesn't get the location completely right because the presence of this charge perturbs the force over here as well. So this the slight errors because this charge is not too far. But close enough, you can see them there. As a, here's a second example, but that's, that's exactly it. So this B can, by doing this, using the algorithm, map the location of charges. If it keeps track of the amount of the deflection, you can also figure out what is the charge value on these objects. And the number of observations it has to make scales the number of points. It only has to make uh, sorry, it has it has it, it makes two n observations here, and it has to make do n squared computations to prove its existence. So the observation load increases linearly, and the computation load increases quadratically uh, with, with the number of points you want to happen. Okay, I think I will stop this. Sorry, actually, I'm also out of time. So let me just summarize. So to our knowledge, this is the first pattern. To model linear like perception, uh, to understand, to put some some numbers and some schematic understanding on this phenomenon, uh, and we've done a lot of work on how we can tell the difference between an electric field and acoustic sensing. So the same here can do both. Uh, I'm completely not spoken about that here, but I think I'll do it later if you want. Uh, it's one of the few sensitive perceptions that can give you geometric information from a distance. Go to the flower. And what, one thing that's not clear at all is so far we have assumed that we, we keep track of electric fields by two point charges and their location. But maybe this is not the best way to do it. There's an open question which I'm really interested in how, what is the most optimal way to process information? It's maybe the point charge approach is not the right way to do it. And I think that's all I have for today. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's good. It's a good question. Yes. I don't know anything about how these Actually, I don't know either. So this, this is a completely 
Conception, which I have no idea how these work. I can kind of understand it like uh, it's spontaneous thing that they send something and then they just send it and it so if you if you do a label memory, but you have a lot of parents, but yeah, yeah, does it improve the picture? Or so can you do this terrain mapping? So you, you can. So so if, if you go back, so if you didn't, so maybe there's something should I mentioned here. The idea of terrain mapping is that you have the map fully in mind for the next time you come around. And so that's why it's a mapping. So that so memory really is for keeping it for future use. But if you didn't want that, yes, you're right. For example, if I come down here. This flower, you could think of this as terrain mapping, right? It's, it's a micro terrain flower, and you want to map it. So, you could, if you have a few hundred hairs, sure, in, in one single measurement, you can resolve these, these points. If you have you might have 100 points over here, the 300 hairs, I can completely resolve it instantaneously. But the, the terrain idea was that it's a larger, it's, it's, it's a large field. So, I have to move around. I can't just do it from one single space. But also, I want to. If I come back here tomorrow, I want to say, wait, wait a minute, I've been here before. This this he looks familiar. What do I plan? Okay, so so the, okay, so my my plans are somewhat conceptual. So I would like to continue working on all these parts, right? So ask the question, not how does the video do it. But how could a, a, a creature with these abilities do it? So it'd be conceptual psychology. But if empirical evidence becomes available, then it would be very interesting to try to bring in some of that. But if you knew about maybe the arrangement of the brain or some uh, empirical evidence about what they can do and what they cannot do, mm -hmm. then of course I'd be really interested in incorporating that into more. Uh, are they known to be able to mark the terrain or they come back to the same way? I don't know. I don't know. What we do know, so some of the things here they can do, right? So, for example, they can fly at a specified angle to the sun. So, if, if that's my sun, as a bee, I can fly towards this direction or a given angle towards it. Mm -hmm. And I can, they can keep rough track of distances. And we know this because we know they communicate this information somehow to other bees in the battle dance. So they're, they're able to do that for sure. Now, they clearly have enough memory to come back and tell somebody else, hey, go in this direction for 100 meters. Is it normal where mosquitoes do the same thing? Mm -hmm. uh, the for I want skin or something like that. Mm -hmm. I, mean, human skin as well. I think it's more likely to be thermal and acoustic. I think, I'm not sure, but I guess it's more like, yes, I think so. Okay. 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 Yeah, but I don't know if it's where it comes from. Yeah, yeah, sure. They, they, yes, they, they can come back home. My ants can do it as well, for example. But it's not here. And for example, ants don't do it by activity. Yeah. Can I, you do it again from them? I'm just procrastinating since you don't have exam measure. Okay, that's the other reason I'm giving this company. Right, so this is coming from the industry. Yeah. So if anybody would like to calculate in a test case, of which I know nothing, I knew nothing until last week. <laughs> uh, learned something last week. I'd be very interested in, in working on that. Yes, absolutely. It's part of his magic and stuff. But at the moment, it's complete. It's, it's really it's it's really completely unexploited. So the 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 four papers I said at the beginning published by our group, to my knowledge, these are the only four papers available that you can. Trying to build up a model. I tell you, papers. This, I think, this has been known for about ten years that little section exists, and aquatic animals has been known for much longer, of course. But we have empirical, some empirical evidence is coming in, coming in, but no one has tried to sit down and say that's conceptually the thing to hold this one work. So it's really fresh area to get into. And this is with the electrobiology and the that is strongly driven by direct yeah. applications. Yeah. 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 Ye
Yeah. So it might be that you're putting in the cost directly without the complete design to it. So it's, and that might be a headline to come to as well. But also, there's a concern, and I don't know how much is completely known, that pesticides have electrical signatures that we are not being aware of until now. And it's also fun for us humans because it's a sensitive perception that we have no, we don't have, right? It's a, it's an alien world. So it's, it's, I think it's fun to work on that as well. Yeah. Pardon me? They are Don't tell that to my colleague Daniel Robert who loves spiders. <laughs> Yeah, but there are less common spiders everywhere. You can find them anywhere. And you also need to use spiders. That's true, but you have to be careful because they come in lots of species. So you want to be a species and sanitize them. People have studied the uh, material properties of the spider silk. Spider silk, yeah. 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 It's very sticky. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very yes. Very tough. Yeah. tough. There's a lot of work on that, yes. And I, 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 if I understand right, I think the full mechanics of how it's generated is probably known as a, that's an interesting problem as well. How do they shoot out? Very interesting. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so that's one biological material where you crystallize it. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not surprised that the, that the electricity might be doing something because that might have to the alignment of the of the little crystal molecules. So it all makes sense. Yeah, that's just I didn't, I didn't know that one. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.